ai, uh, eu mai zic că tot băieții ăștia sunt responsabili, adică datorită sau mulțumită lor, avem uh, uh, enforced, ca să, în lipsa unui alt cuvânt mai bun, uh, ideea de warning-uri la, la, la părăsirea benzii uh, sau uh, frânare automată în caz de un anume pericol. Uh, chestiile astea intră în standardul ADAS și ei sunt cei care uh, au obligat pe producătorii de mașini din 2024 nu doar să le aibă, dar și să poată să răspundă în caz de posibile vulnerabilități cu mașinile lor, să răspundă prompt. Uh, partea asta este adas este cumva precursorul ceea ce la ceea ce probabil fiecare dintre voi se gândește sau își imaginează că ar fi autonomous driving. Încă nu suntem acolo, dar avem încercări în direcția asta. Aproape. În sensul că în Japonia din 2023 o să permită mașinilor autonome level 4 ce ce permit și interacțiune umană minimală pe, pe străzi. În China deja și Statele Unite deja avem mașini care rulează, de exemplu, San Francisco în funcție de condiții de meteo, de un interval orar, de diverse alte condiții, vă puteți plimba cu un taxi robotizat. La fel cum zis și în China. Acum, de ce, de ce menționez asta cu, cu ai Pentru că inevitabil o să avem un impact în zona asta. Vedeți acum la mine un, probabil, cei care v-ați mai... Este cineva care nu recunoaște ce avem aici? Sau nu poate să citească titlul? Îmi imaginez că toată lumea poate să, să vadă asta. Acum, ce este cea GPT sau de ce discut de, când e vorba de securitate de cea GPT? Adică, nu că uh, îmi place să mă aflu în treabă, dar uh, chestia asta care a apărut undeva în sfârșit de noiembrie uh, a făcut valuri destul de mari. Valuri uh, ce au fost văzute și în zona asta de securitate. Și pentru că voiam să discut și despre o tehnologie sau o o tehnologie care ar putea să impacteze pe viitor, securitatea l-am ales pe ăsta fiind mai așa mai aproape de majoritatea uh, oamenilor tehnici uh, din, uh, din sală. Uh, o să menționez câteva cazuri și până vă, vă explic și, și exemplul. Uh, undeva pe uh, 21 decembrie uh, un uh, hacker pe, pe unul din formule de, așa, de, de specialitate uh, a publicat o serie de scripturi Python Java care făceau uh, anumite activități. Una din ele era uh, căuta o serie de fișiere, le copia și le trimitea peste un FTP criptat, celălalt cripta, decripta uh, 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 nu, celălalt uh, scris în Java, uh, uh, rula un, uh, un putty uh, prin, uh, prin intermediul PowerShell-ului. Uh, chestiile astea puteau practic să fie uh, malware, puteau să fie date personale uh, cu care interacționa, iar ce e cel mai important este că nu a scris o linie de cod în, în tot procesul ăsta, s-a folosit de uh, chat GPT. Uh, scripturile generate nu au fost perfecte, puteau fi modificate, dar uh, ce, ce voiam să subliniez era că au scăzut entry level în, uh, în zona asta de uh, grey black hat hacking. Uh, acum ce am încercat eu să, să descopăr a fost uh, dacă poate să-mi spună care ar fi cele mai relevante articole din zona de automotive security a dat o serie de articole. Din păcate le-a dat greșit. 
s-a focusat foarte mult însă pe articole din presă, nu pe articole din jurnale și conferințe de specialitate. Vă, vă ofer aici un exemplu. A găsit imediat nu mai văd acum, a găsit acest uh, articol, dar de fapt numele, după câte observa, art, autorii sunt corect, numele este uh, greșit, însă uh, informația este pe acolo, e, e corect. Dacă vreți să vă amuzați însă, uh, am încercat să-l să și întrebăm ce este mai greu, un kilogram de pene pe Jupiter sau un kilogram de plumb pe pământ. Nu a reușit să răspundă corect prima dată. L-am corectat. Iar la scurt timp o altă persoană, altă entitate a primit răspunsul corect. Învață destul de rapid. Asta s-a întâmplat în aceea zi. Lucrurile astea inevitabil o să ne impacteze. O să fie alte tehnologii care la fel o să, uh, o să ne impacteze și nu înseamnă că trebuie să, să, să abordezi asta cu, cu temele, ci să te pregătești pentru un necunoscut și să asiguri cumva uh, acele procese care să, să-ți permită să răspunzi prompt. Și atunci... Uh, ne întoarcem către a doua parte a prezentării mele. Care e contribuția mea în toată asta? Și contribuția pe care am încercat să o dau în cadrul tezei de doctorat a fost acest concept de security by design. Cum l-am văzut eu. Și rezultatul este o arhitectură care încearcă să asigure exența shareholderilor multipli a unei unor cunoștințe diverse, open source, tehnologii integrate din diverse first party și producători chiar, care la final să, să, să permită noțiunea asta de incluziune în procesul ăsta de uh, interacțiune cu uh, autovehicul, uh, ca și un uh, entertainment area, dacă vreți să, să o numim așa. Uh, Contribuția asta arată uh, uh, sub, uh, sub forma de, de pe slide. Este o arhitectură digitală. Uh, ce permite update-ul uh, remote. Uh, focusul a fost uh, în general în zona de Linux Android. Uh, dar nu, nu exclude sisteme de, uh, de, de familie Autosar sau uh, Rutos, care sunt, uh, acum, uh, sincer vorbind, sunt mai ușor de certificat formal că, că pot fi secure, că îndeplinesc standardele, uh, așa cum uh, le numește industria de asil D, cele mai, uh, cele mai stricte standarde de securitate. Uh, dar... Uh, Acum, ce, ce am încercat să. adică ce ar trebui o astfel de arhitectură? Poate nu asta e soluția, poate sunt alte, alte elemente pe care ar trebui să ne focusăm, sau poate, dar în arhitectura despre care vă, vă discut s-a uitat la următoarele constrângeri. Prima din ele este partea de încredere și confidențialitate. Faptul că producătorul nu poate să aibă încredere în clientul său, 
faptul că clientul nu poate să aibă încredere în șofer și așa mai departe. Asta este o, o realitate. Existența unei comunicări externe, fie că discutăm de standarde de, 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 de genul DSRC, uh, Wi-Fi 3, 4, 5G sau uh, Bluetooth, astea sunt, uh, sunt uh, la fel constrângeri. Uh, securitatea hardware, sistemele de operare, uh, uh, faptul că uh, industria preferă în continuare hardware of the shelf, uh, sisteme de operare ce rulează direct pe microcontrol, bare metal, partea de autentificare, interoperabilitate, mobilitate, avem distanțe lungi parcurse cu un astfel de vehicul, uh, putem să ne gândim la, la camioane, trebuie să avem în condițiile astea, suport pentru service, întreținere și așa mai departe, realizat oriunde. Pe astea o să încerc să le mai. ca să le. încerc să le parc pe toate, o să, o să mai uit un pic pe, pe hârtie, mă scuzați. A, A e? Ok, e ok. A, Rețeaua din, din, din vehicul avem o serie de protocoale ce nu sunt tocmai custom, avem cana, lin, most, flesei, protocoale foarte specifice, tot așa focusul pe cost, nu atât de mult pe performanță și securitate. Interacțiunea dintre securitate și siguranță, putem să avem un vehicul non-secur uh, uh, care nu este sigur, uh, chestiile astea încă nu sunt definite foarte bine din punct de vedere al uh, interacțiunii dintre ele. Uh, originile acestor sisteme electronice ele pot fi uh, oferite de producător, dar pot fi oferite și la third party. Cred că ați auzit cu toții povestea, lasă că știu eu, am eu un băiat care te poate rezolva. Asta e o, o realitate în sine. Sunt cerințe legale, nu peste tot avem aceleași reglementări și așa mai departe. A, și întreținerea, actualizarea astea sunt la fel o serie de... A, a, sunt proprietăți importante pentru că, în general, durata de viață a unui vehicul e undeva la 12 ani. A unui camion undeva la 20-30 de ani. Trebuie să, cu hardware ăla învechit, tu trebuie să asiguri același nivel de securitate și buna funcționare a produsului tău. Și, bineînțeles, arhitectura încearcă cumva să le discute și să ofere soluții la, la problema asta. Acum, revenim la subtitlul prezentării. De ce e relevant, de ce sunt relevante competiții studențești? ce implică performanță în contextul securității. Impresia mea e că nu le poți avea pe una fără cealaltă, mai ales în contextul în care ne, ne aflăm noi. Și prin intermediul astfel, unor astfel de uh, competiții putem asigura performanță și securitate uh, doar făcând lucrurile uh, în modul corect asigurându-ne că uh, aceste constrângeri sunt îndeplinite din momentul în care începem conceperea unui, unui astfel de produs. De exemplu, uh, avem uh, uh, un bun control al memoriei, uh, îndeplinim standardele de confidențialitate, uh, mecanisme de autentificare și așa mai departe. Acum, ce face, ce face o astfel de competiție este destul de simplu. Permite echipelor de studenți de la diverse facultăți să proiecteze, să construiască și să optimizeze 
niște monoposturi, uh, o, urcă studenții în ele și le permite să concureze uh, între ei uh, cu alte universități. Con cursul se realizează în două, are două mari categorii, una statică, evenimente statice, din zona de proiectare pe, cu accent pe proiectarea inginerească, cu accent pe costurile de producție, pe prezentarea business planului și apoi este partea dinamică la care intră doar acele echipe care trec, trec în general o o, o inspecție tehnică riguroasă, realizată în general de uh, ingineri ce lucrează în companii automotive. De exemplu, uh, la competiția din vară, uh, au fost ingineri de la Volkswagen care au certificat ca cel monopost construit de studenții de la Poltenică era uh, uh, ready to race sau nu. Între probele dinamice avem Hitpad acel 8 în, pe circuit, avem autocross, avem uh, anduranță și economie de, de combustibil și, bineînțeles, accelerare. Și la astfel de, la astfel de competiție a participat uh, și, și UPB Drive. Uh, ca și, dacă ne uităm pe un timeline, echipa s-a format undeva în 2018, în 2019 au participat la competiții, competiția din Olanda, doar la probele statice, atunci aveau doar un șasiu pe care au încercat să-l să valideze. Apoi a venit pandemia, am Apucat, a fost efectiv o perioadă în care uh, echipa doar a re rezistat, a strâns piese, a strâns cunoștințe, a strâns uh, parteneri. Uh, și ce, ce vedeți aici este rezultatul din, uh, din 2000, de practic vara trecută, 2022. Uh, uh, și nu, nu am reușit să venim doar cu un monopost, dar am reușit să facem și niște gogoși la Red Bull Show, deși nu ne-au lăsat organizatorii, dar avem niște studenți încăpățânați. Asta este. Da. Acum revin la, la noțiunea de, pe care am introdus la, la început. Securitate trebuie să fie un mindset în general, asta e, asta e impresia mea, de asta și o, am menționat-o că poate fi privită ca o, ca o religie, nu pot decât să, să, să închei prin a vă menționa că a așteptăm donații, glumesc sau nu știu, vedem, putem să, putem să discutăm după. Vă, vă mai las cu, cu o singură idee. Dacă nu pot să rup o chestie în cea mai, cele mai mici unități din care, din care este formată, Impresia mea este că nu o poți înțelege în întregime și uh, ce fac uh, oamenii ăștia este fix chestia aia. Ingineri fiind uh, realizează totul de la cel mai mic șurub până la cele mai bune performanțe în 1100. Uh, mă mulțumesc pentru atenție. Asta am fost eu. O întrebare legată de formula student și nu numai. În general, competițiile dedicate sporturilor cu motor. Toată lumea nu poate să nege nimeni 
progresul tehnologic care a fost adus pe partea de motoare, aerodinamică, sisteme de propulsie și combustibil, dar care a fost contribuția pe partea de securitate? Pentru că până acum nimeni n-a, n-a discutat despre acest aspect. De exemplu, ce-am, ce-am câștigat pe partea de securitate din raliu, for, uh, cursa de 24 de ore de la Le Mans sau Formula 1? Uh, Ok, mersi de întrebare. Uh, încerc să, să formulez un, 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 un răspuns. Nu, nu-mi dau seama dacă este, dacă este ceea ce, uh, ce îți dorești, dar uh, dacă, dacă, un lucru, dacă nu vezi un lucru, nu înseamnă că nu, nu s-a întâmplat. Știi? Uh, iar din punct de vedere al, al motorsportului, chestia asta se vede în, 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 tocmai în protocoalele de intercomunicare între echipe, în apiurile alea pe care, de care menționam la început, că au început să fie dintre cele mai, dintre cele mai vulnerabile. Acum, cum, uh, nu am să îți dau un exemplu de uh, un, o vulnerabilitate uh, a, a unei echipe care, nu știu, s-au, s-au pierdut o serie de date, dar, în general, uh, ce, uh, ce, ce a câștigat foarte mult, uh, sau nu, nu am să, să-ți dau date efective, dar în, în zona asta de aplicații, zona de telemetrie, acolo s-au, s-au câștigat foarte mult. imaginează că sunt o grămadă de companii de la implicate ce, cu, ce se ocupă nu doar cu procesarea și calculul acestor date, au din 90 încoace zona asta de motorsport s-a mutat de la uh, a arunca banii în probleme, la a încerca să optimizezi costurile pentru a rezolva problemele și invariabil chestia asta s-a, s-a, s-a mutat către uh, uh, zona asta de uh, cum, uh, cum facem simulările cât mai optim, cum putem să uh, le, le realizăm cât mai aproape de modelul real și uh, asta implică un consum de uh, putere computațională și uh, un număr de date extrem de mare. Iar în cazul ăsta, acolo a fost, uh, acolo a fost uh, contribuția. Alte întrebări? Cel puțin când vine vorba de industria de automotive, știm că de obicei când apare o mașină nouă pe piață, întâi se stabilește un preț și câteva proprietăți generale, gen un sub de oraș care se vândă cu 30.000 de euro, să zicem. Cum afectează parametrii ăștia dezvoltarea pe partea de securitate, pentru că e un cost destul de mare și această parte de software și hardware. Ok. Uh, cred că asta te poate, uh, aici am un răspuns mai scurt, dar te poate ajuta mai rapid. Uh, 40% din valoarea unei mașini este software plus hardware. Cred că asta răspunde la întrebare. Păi, ă, asta am zis că ă, când, am, ă, când am prezentat ă, arhitectura, astea am zis că au fost constrângerile din ă, ei în calcul, înainte de a proiecta soluția de aceste constrângeri. Am menționat ă, printre ele și ă, costul componentelor electronice, originile lor, ă, încrederea și confidențialitatea datelor și așa mai departe. Asta inevitabil trebuie să le iei în calcul. Nu, nu, poți să, nu poți să faci securitate într-o lume ideală.
că mereu să o uh, ancorezi în realitate. Atunci, mulțumim pentru prezentare, Alex. O să luăm pauză 5 minute pentru setup și refill și ne vedem peste 5 minute.
Merge? Ok. Salut! Uh, o să începem și a doua prezentare. Uh, avem altul de noi pe Virgil Lilian și o să ne povestească despre roles and ethics of developers in the, in the AI content generation space. Virgil. Mulțumesc! Thank you! I'm going to do this in English because I prepared this presentation in English. So, uh, we're here to talk about kind of the elephant in the room in the last uh, few months. And that's kind of like a proverbial elephant that you see there in a proverbial room. Um, we are here to talk about the roles and the ethics of developers, which is most of the audience here, in the AI content generation space. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am an AI expert that helps companies connect research and business. And I have been working with uh, Generative in the past, uh, oh, let's say 10 months. And, of course, more actively since the open source releases have, uh, have started. So, what are we talking about? It is a new revolution, right? Um, before, you could say that technology could do a lot of things, AI could do a lot of things, but could it create arc, art? Could it create a masterpiece? And you have this famous scene from a movie in which they're like, no, of course not, but can you? Something changed though, now the computer can say yes, can you? And boy do artists hate it, in general. So, the death of art has been proclaimed in the last few months. You have a BBC article saying the, uh, that art is dead. You have a contest that was won by somebody who made a piece with AI. So, it's, we've been seeing a lot of evolution. The evolution has been very, very fast in the past few years. 2015, we were all playing around with Deep Dream, uh, generating uh, hallucinations with AI by, by inverting models. And around that same time, instead of, giving it, uh, instead of giving it directly an image to work with, people were starting to give it concepts to work with. Uh, for example, you see there how a herd of elephants flying in blue skies looked like in 2015. And, okay, you can kind of get it, but it's not really there. Um, in, by 2017, we were able to generate kind of something in the idea space that we were looking for. This was a cityscape generated um, back then with an AI from that moment. By 2018, people said, okay, if we narrow down the problem space, we try to only generate faces, maybe we can do something. So NVIDIA released StyleGAN, and StyleGAN 2, and StyleGAN, well, I think it's free right now, with which they were just generating faces. And there's this famous website, this person does not exist, in which you would see uh, generated images of people who were not real in any, any moment. And it was pretty good, it was pretty good. Even here, you can't see it probably on the projector, but you can, uh, they had issues with uh, glasses going through the face and so on, but overall it was pretty believable. So believable, actually, that you could see Facebook profiles popping up for these fake people, especially around elections. Yeah, that was a fun time, a few years ago. But overall, we overcame that, uh, that problem. And by 2021, we had these releases from, this is from OpenAI, in which you see uh, completely novel concepts being generated that were not present in the training data. So you would have the, an arm chain in the shape of an avocado. Like, nobody fed this into the AI. They fed avocados, they fed armchairs, the AI knows what they are, and together they know how to make an um, avocado chair. So, you can see the evolution from 2017 to 2022, you have, uh, that's what a cat looked like initially, like that blob of uh, of pixels, and in 2022 we already reached like a, this uh, very complicated generation space. And now, in 2023, we're striving for ease of use and realism, which, are, which is popping up more and more, and it's becoming more and more accessible. People are saying, oh, this is cheating, this is terrible, this, won't, uh, this is destroying art. But truth be told, if we look 
at the history of things, we were, we've always been using tools. Artists have always been using tools to help them paint, help them create art, help them do many, many things. Back in the 1400s, right, you had the painting frame, which was this frame that they would take out to the fields, take out to the streets to paint with it. By the 1600s, you had mirrors, and the likes of Leonardo da Vinci are supposed to have used these kinds of uh, devices too. Um, and these uh, mirrored camera obscura systems were also also quite in vogue, and they're well documented in the in the literature of the time, but still people think that using tools is somehow cheating. And by the 1800s, we actually had a very small portable device called the Camera Lucida, which actually powered the Impressionist movement at the time. They all had one. Nobody tells you this, but they all had Camera Lucidas, and that's why their perspectives are so nice, and on top of that, you have a lot of, uh, of uh, movement color and add it into the into the scenes so as you see uh, they have a great great history artists have a great history of using these uh, helper tools and of course as long as these tools have existed there's always been the question like oh the each generation of artists are is wondering oh am I as good as the old masters because they didn't use this tool but uh, well I'm sure each at each level um, they were uh, asking themselves these questions Except probably the caveman, who, although they maybe thought they were the best, they were still using shadows to draw, right? We have the, all these experiments done on the ca in the caves and the oldest cave paintings that have been found in France, I believe, and so on, where actually it shows that they were painting using torchlight, they were painting using models, they were painting shadows, and so on. So reference was, references were still being used. And more recently, we have the discussion that photography is not art, right? Oh, uh, there's some, unfortunately, there's some text here that doesn't show up. Oh, God. Okay, it's great text there, uh, but it, it shows you a timeline of photography not being, not being uh, detected as art. So it's, it goes all the way from, I'll tell you now, from the eight, 1839 to 2001. Like, there's a bunch of events here that unfortunately are invisible. That showed you every time photography was dispelled as not being art. So every time it was, they were saying photography is not art, photography is not art. And the latest one was in 2001 when, although film photography was considered art, it was con eventually it was considered uh, digital photography was not considered art anymore because you know it's pixels, it's not film that matters, right? But the core of the argument was the whole time that this is a mechanical process, right? If it includes something mechanical in it, it can't be art. Of course, we overcame that, but by the mid 20th century, again, sorry, I didn't know this wasn't going to be visible. <laughs> There's a lot of text here. <laughs> the idea was that um, people realized that they're not actually creating art to be art they're creating content. And there's this famous quote from uh, Theodor Adorno in 1967 that says, cultural entities typical of the cultural industry are no longer also commodities, they are commodities through and through. What does that mean? It, the idea is that you're not creating a painting to be art and then it's gonna be sold somewhere secondarily. You're creating something to be sold, something to be used as content, that could be art secondarily, but primarily it was created to be content. So we have this content creation industry, right? So we go from these offices filled with people that could produce content, whether it's animation frames, whether it's posters, whether it's uh, even CAD drawings, right, for buildings and so on. We have computers that enter the scene, and they revolutionized everything, and they remove all these huge offices, but still there's a lot of people involved in creating content, to eventually now people that use smartphones with their computers to film. Some modern influencers actually uh, use uh, just their phone to edit and film and everything, and they do everything on their phone. But we're at the moment of more freedom in which people can use whatever device they want uh, for these uh, content productions. And it's kind of like this for every single disruptive industry that we've faced so far 
as a civilization, like as far as we can remember. We go for these questions every single time we have a revolution. This is a comic from 2013 by XKCD. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people uh, here follow this, uh, this web comic. It shows you uh, simple answers. Will it make, uh, will blank make us geniuses? No. Will morons? No. Will it destroy whole industries? Yes. And there's a lot of things here. Will teens use it for sex? Yes, of course. Where are they going to have sex anyway? Yes. Will, will blank destroy music? No. Will it destroy art? No, of course not. And we ca can we go back to a time when, no, <laughs> we can't go back. And it won't bring world peace and will not cause widespread alienation and the end of everything we know and hold dear. I would like to draw attention to a few things here, though, on this list, because it's interesting that it applies to everything. And they say, um, no, not the sex. I wanted to draw attention to uh, the industries. Will it destroy whole industries? Yes. And think about it. It's about the industry. It's not about the jobs. It's not about the people. It will affect industries. And this is generally valid all over. And the second one is, can we go back to a time? We can't go back to a time where this doesn't exist because it's been invented. You know, the cat is out of the box, the rabbit is out of the hat, however you want to say it. And sometimes it would, would have always come out. So you say, okay, but this is a 21st century interpretation of this, right? It can't be that uh, this has always been happening. This is from 2013, that's just 10 years ago, right? 100 years ago. I'm, I kid you not, I, I found this. This is a cartoon from 1923 describing the year 2023 <laughs> in which a publisher has fired his artist because he now has Cartoon Dynamo drawing his comics for the newspaper. I'm not making this up. I actually fact-checked this. I thought it was fake when I found this. I, I, I went through it. It's been written about like every few years somebody writes about this cartoon. And I found an article from 2014 in which they talked about it, right? So, yeah, we're in 2023. This cartoon was spot on by Mr. Webster, who I'm sure is long dead, unfortunately. But uh, it predicts the disruption of this uh, content production industry. I would say art, it's content production industry for the newspapers. And if you kind of take a look at how the industry looked just a few years ago, it was kind of bleak. Like content production of paintings, uh, drawings, and so on was pretty bad. Like there's this whole city, Dafen, who is producing 60% of the old oil paintings in the world. It's in China. And it was not the only one. And yeah, there is this scary quote in which you would go down the street and it will all smell like paint and everything and it, people would be uh, bidding on the lowest, uh, lowest amount of money to pay for the, for the paintings. It was uh, very, very scary. You can look it up, Dafen City. Um, there's also like uh, Simpsons made fun of their own production studio when they hired Banksy and they showed the, like a sweatshop. And that's an actual photo from uh, about 10 years ago, I believe, from a Japanese animation studio in which people are just passed out at their desks trying to produce as much anime as they can. So, um, yeah, disruption came to this industry and I hope it will improve things because this is pretty bleak. This was the state of the picture production, content production industry at the time. So, AI crashed the party, right? And is it here to help? Well, um, you have here a generative AI landscape. This is actually from a few months ago. It made, it's made by Sequoia Capital, this taxonomy. And I actually wanted to update it. But the new one was so full, you couldn't actually see anything on the slide when I scaled it to this size. And it was like, the logos were so small, you could barely make them out. So I just kept this old one. There's a ton of them, just go look it up, Sequoia, the Capital Taxonomy, there's way more right now. But uh, I paired this because uh, we have here, let's see, does this work? Oh, yeah. Um, there's, uh, for example, here there's a few open source tools like Stability AI Release Table Diffusion, and the founder of Stability, uh, Emma Mostak, said that uh, this great quote, quote, that so much of the world is creatively constipated and we're going to make it so that they can poop rainbows. So I think that's very fitting right now, both in the good and the bad that describes the situation. 
So yeah, this is what AI did in just a few months. In the past six months, we've seen this huge, huge revolution. As you saw, people, experts especially, could see it coming at least 10 years ago. But it was a consequence of the improvement of image processing algorithms, among which was also the improvement uh, brought on by the mobile phone revolution, right? People were evolving AI processing algorithms on images to make better photos on your mobile phones. And this ha kind of grew, out, grew in parallel to that, this image generation landscape. So what can AI make right now? Well, people have been taking it and starting to make like re remixing old games, upgrading graphics for old games. They can take small sketches and create nice artwork out of them. They can generate new concepts, right? Um, some, uh, that's an architectural concept generated to, to just sketch out some ideas. Jewelry concepts, fake vacation photos. Yeah, I did not wrestle a crocodile, believe it or not, but I have a photo. Uh, and even product designs. And some say this whole presentation was written by a robot. So this whole idea is that now, uh, instead of just having the skill to need, needing to draw things out, you have to speak to the machine. It, people call it prompt engineering, and you have to learn how to speak to the machine. In the same way that a rider knows how to talk to a horse, like they need to learn how to do that, a prompt engineer knows how to talk to the AI. And some do, even the reverse, use AI as a muse for uh, by inputting words in poetry and see what comes out. So they use it as a remixing machine. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the straightforward way. Like you need to instruct the AI to draw something. So you need to tell it like what to draw, the details, the style of the subject, details for the image, and the style of the image, right? And I made here an example, like a picture of a rabbit, small, cute, sitting, looking at the camera, fluffy, flames of the car, from the car illuminate the street, vehicle burns in the background. It's an 8K photo, deep depth of field, and it's a for, for, make it look like it's in the style of a Photoshop contest, right? And this is the image that was generated, especially for this presentation, right? Pretty nice. Uh, of course, it I didn't get it right on the first try. This this took a this took a while, and in general, it takes a while. The person who I presented earlier, who uh, won an art contest with this, spent a total of two weeks of continuous work just to get the right image and compositing multiple ones. So this general uh, notion you see in the press that, um, oh yeah, AI, AI, AI images are generated super fast. They just do art by j j slapping some words in there and that's it. No, if you want to get something specific, it, it's pretty complicated, right? It's a skill to do this. So yeah, this guy took weeks, weeks to do this, weeks of work to, to create this uh, composite picture. And this was a few months ago. Uh, at this point, you can consider like, this is not really advanced considering the state of the art. You saw those cats that I showed you earlier. Those are way better than um, the output from here. But see, it's interesting to see the evolution in just a few months. Fortunately, artists are using this new skill, and I took this example of an artist who makes a base sketch and then starts going through different styles and tries to remix his own artwork. And not only is he doing this from uh, himself, like using a base image to guide his own work, but I actually took this from an ad in which he does commissions for this, to helps artists get better. The helping artists turn sketches into something better and leveling up their own skills in doing this because it shows them, okay, you drew this, here is how it can go. And imagine these variations of your own thing. So it's doing it for himself and teaching others how to do it. So here we go. Uh, at this point, we can just uh, try to make a conclusion. Is AI taking any job at the moment? Not really, it's taking some tasks for out of a job. But as you saw, there's a lot of skill and there's a lot of human work involved in, in using this AI and even using the base sketches. So in general, this is a maxim that I like to, to show. AI doesn't do jobs, it does tasks. And it's up to humans to hone their skills to utilize the AI. And we have this famous robot here that was just built to do one task, pass the butter. Yeah. If you don't know what that is, look it up, Google it. <laughs> okay, so, ah, damn it, all my gray text is gone. Uh, I 
think this is because we downloaded it. No, it's funny. It's fine, fine. There was a lot of facts here, apparently, which uh, I can't even see, so I won't repeat them. But the idea is that AI increases economic output, and this has been quite well studied. Um, AI is aiding in productivity in general, and you can see these uh, nice statistics that show this. What does this mean? Is that it means that it makes people more, more efficient. So it doesn't really show that um, robots replace people because, you know, we just went through a global pandemic. Some say we're still in it. Uh, if robots were going to replace us, why didn't they save us when we were in need of work during the pandemic? Everyone was locked in the house and we still had to go to work, most of us at least, right? Either working from home or in case you didn't have a job that could be done from home, you had to go to work actually to do your job. So where were the robots back then if they, they were so magical taking all our jobs? Unfortunately, yeah, the world ended and we still had to go to work. Um, so yeah, this is the situation. And this applies to content creation too. It doesn't necessarily replace everything a content creator does. It just aids in their activity. So we have the future right now. Again, my degree text is gone, but this, was a, this slide was about the future. And the next ones we, we see are text-to-video AIs, which will come after image generation, because there's a few prototypes. You here see one from Meta and one from Google with Imogen. And people say, OK, is that all AIs can do now? Well, no. These techniques that have been taken up right now are um, doing a hell of a lot more, like generate motion, generating genes. Uh, are they taking the jobs of the future? No, they're shaping the jobs of the future, right? And it allows people who are good at their jobs to become great at their jobs, and people who are great at their jobs are going to become superstars if they learn how to use these, these systems. And we also have, uh, some people say text to text, I call them large language models, and you can find them. There's a lot of large language models, most famous one being ChatGPT, in which you see here how it was actually, this flowchart shows you how it was created. Uh, the previous speaker also mentioned ChatGPT as being kind of inaccurate, but quite fluent. Um, well, I think we all know people like that in real life too, so maybe those people are afraid of being replaced. But um, the idea is that now you have a coherent AI that was trained that knows how to keep context. And the biggest advantage ChatGPT brings is that it can understand all the context of the conversation going forward and doesn't forget very easily. So because of this, even though large language models have existed for quite a while, they are now uh, starting to gather a lot of attention. So man and machine uh, are right, make a winning combination. Well, by the way, again, a generated image, especially for this presentation, so of, uh, of that. So yes and no. Yes, you can draw this uh, comparison historically. Unfortunately, people are pretty mad about this. There's a lot of controversies um, about using AI. Uh, a man used uh, to write and illustrate a children's book in one weekend. It came out pretty badly, to be honest. It was a pretty bad book, in my opinion. But still, he drew attention, not because of the quality of the work, but because it had been used. He used uh, con AI to generate everything. Other artists have gone to the websites to, have, uh, to, to protest AI usage. And of course, they're uh, trying to bully a lot of people that try to use AI, for example, in their articles. Uh, that uh, Charlie guy there went viral because his article was illustrated with uh, AI art and everybody tried to boycott him, so he went out and said he was sorry. Um, and this happens in the public sector too. Uh, public schools have banned GPT because they require, chat GPT because uh, it requires, uh, they require original thought and work from students. That's interesting, it's debatable, uh, but it's very, very interesting that this is happening. And of course, there's a, a lot of controversy about how these models have been built, too. Uh, training data is very controversial. There's a number of lawsuits that have been filed. Uh, ChatGPT is still being curated by $2 workers from Kenya who 
$2, are paid $2 an hour to keep uh, ChatGPT from going crazy and racist and all sorts of terrible things, like as you have noticed happens to all the chatbots exposed to the internet. This is why it's not happening to ChatGPT. These people are there to, to safeguard it. And yeah, it's quite a mess right now because they've, they've sued GitHub for using Copilot for generating code, for the image generators have been sued because they use the images from the internet and so on. Uh, and the legal debate is far from over. And I believe like the ethical debate is something that we can have in the public forum and discuss constantly. But it's very important to have informed opinions when talking about these things. So if you look at the past, this has happened before. Like literally these things have happened before. Especially when, for, I, I like this example because it's talking about canned music in uh, theaters because they used to have uh, live music in theaters and cinemas and so on. And when it, the recording industry started, it was a whole mess because people were arguing against it. And if you look at today, I took this tweet, which is wonderful, because somebody is arguing that, of course, this isn't uh, the same way as music here. Uh, sampling music creates a new music genre, and AI art creates content that's indistinguishable from human art. I don't know. If you look at these articles, they were making the same arguments back then. And this reply is absolutely great because it's highlighting that the models and the technology using and cre used to create new new content with these uh, starting from these sources with these training this training data is going to create new forms of expression new genres and it's quite incomprehensible now to see where this is going to go so we're here to talk about developers though most of the people here are developers so what considerations, if you're working on this kind of technology, I know some of you are, I know, I know you know who you are, but uh, you are working with this kind of technology, on this kind of technology, so maybe there is some responsibility with developers in building this kind of transformational tech. And yeah, you have to look a little bit at what you're doing, you have to estimate the impact, you have to look at the usage target of what you're building, you have to be careful about design patterns, especially to avoid something like dark patterns. And you also have to look at the competition landscape. Fortunately, while this sounds quite complicated, there's things like design thinking, which is a very nice one. There's other frameworks. I just pick on this one because it's very easy to find graphs about it, right? So in which you start with empathizing and then you define ID, prototype, and test. And it's a loop, right? So. It's about a loop, a continuous iteration cycle. Keep your iterations short and you iterate on that. And with each iteration cycle, be mindful about what you are doing. Because it's important that you don't stop. It kind of is very important that you don't stop and that you don't design maliciously, you don't isolate and you don't worship, especially don't worship the technology you're building on because it doesn't love you back. You have to take into consideration all these things and work, uh, try your best to work ethically. And some people would say at this point, okay, I don't want that kind of uh, responsibility. I just want to bow out. You know, I'm just gonna, not going to do this. If I don't do this, it's not going to happen. Well, sorry to tell you this, but it is going to happen even without you. And if it's not you, then it's going to be somebody else who might have different considerations. So. If you want to work on this kind of technology, you should keep in mind that it should be you because somebody else might get it wrong. Think about that. So, and a, a concrete example of that is Mr. Steven Sasson, who invented uh, digital, the digital camera for Kodak. It was shelved because they said, oh no, this is going to destroy industries. This is going to be terrible for us. This is going to be terrible for everyone. Of course, it ended up destroying the company that invented it because they didn't adapt. They decided to shelve this kind of technology. And yeah, then nothing happened in the end for, that, for Kodak. How many of you still have a Kodak camera, right? Maybe in an old drawer somewhere. Uh, one last note about this. So people say this time it's different. All the arguments you've made, historical arguments you've made are not really valid because Technology, artificial intelligence is different and will have 
artificial general intelligence soon, and we'll have super intelligence. And I want to make two points about this. Uh, this very smart crow here, uh, what people call usually a bird brain, is actually very smart. And this is kind of what you can expect from a general intelligence in the next uh, few decades to come out. So it's not going to be automatically a super intelligence. And if you look at super intelligent humans that you may recognize from this, uh, this photo here, they didn't have the capability just to take over the world and destroy all the jobs in existence, even though by human standards they were super intelligent, right? So it's more of a scale. Once we invent general intelligence, even go, we go from this narrow AI that can do tasks to something that's generally intelligent and towards something that's super intelligent, that doesn't automatically mean it's the end of the game and that all the historical examples are null. There is a scale, there is a timeline to all of this. And to illustrate the complete opposite of this, I want to say, uh, bring up the technological innovations uh, versus economic innovations. Has anyone ever seen this tiny piece of metal here? Probably not, it's the wrong audience for this one. But um, it's actually the connecting system from two containers, right? It's yay big, right? And it's literally a piece of metal, nothing super special about it. It was invented in the mid 20th century to connect containers together, and that made it made ports go from this to this, right? In which volume increased the, with, for the same amount of staff, which also revolutionized the global economy. So with technological innovations, of course, we have to change economic models, we have to change um, also business models, and business models evolve too. They are in a form of innovation constantly, and it doesn't have, even have to be AI to be revolutionary. It can be a simple piece of metal like this. So, my final point is, go forward, because when was the last time when the solution to a new problem was to regress, right? And I would like to imagine everyone says, oh, we need to go back to the office now because we've worked from home and we were efficient. But, okay, there's problems with working from home. There are new problems, right? but we need to find solutions. The same with AI, the same with every single technological innovation. We're not gonna ban the new innovation, we're not gonna ban things. It's not gonna benefit us if we do it. We have plenty of examples where banning innovation was a bad idea, and now we have to come up with new solutions to the problems that have been created. And yeah, thank you. This is what uh, the AI generated when I told it to generate the thank you card. You can kind of see it, don't you? Like. The thank you, but yeah, that's uh, that's a new problem. <laughs> okay, questions. Are we in time or? Kind of. Me first. Ah, okay. I have a question Great. for you. So you mentioned the app uh, platform. This is not a real person. Uh, there's also an, an app that um, a deep, a deep fake that uh, takes people's faces and makes videos with them. So my question is, if I wanted to make um, an application that could spot these kind of videos, how could I train the system? Because even I, as a human, I had a very hard time deciding whether that video is fake or not. Well, first of all, don't assume that because um, you have human perception, that's the best thing that can exist. No offense to anyone. Uh, Computers are very good at things that we are not very good at in general. That's how computing started out, doing extremely complicated large math. So uh, in the case of deepfakes, um, first of all, there's a large amount of skill that is involved in doing this. Uh, I recently evaluated somebody, uh, a process for a, a company about this, and it was took about 120 hours of training to start creating good deepfakes with the tools, with the AI tools. Secondly, um, any AI can be trained on examples, and then it can be set up to figure out how to spot new categories out of this. So if you take examples of original videos and deepfake videos, and you present it to a special AI architecture, you can create a, a detection AI. And several advances have been made in this field, and there are, I think, off-the-shelf detectors who watch for specific deviations, specific elements of the video. But yes, it's, it's very possible, as long as you have a lot of examples. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Dragă Vecir, în primul rând, milă felicitat pentru prezentare, dar și pentru modul vibrant în care ai făcut-o cu totul deosebită. Aș avea o sută de întrebări, probabil că după aceea o să spăstăm la euro, dar ce mă interesează pe mine acum? Dacă, care este părerea ta când inteligența artificială va, va putea să descopere, să clasifice cărțile după conținut? Adică să-și dea seama că aceasta e o carte de filozofie, asta e de poezie, asta e de istorie. Adică e o întrebare care pe mine personal m-ar interesa. Care e părerea ta? Mulțumesc mult înainte. Da, este e o întrebare foarte interesantă, mulțumesc. Nu știu să se fi făcut asta deja și mă întreb de ce. Pentru că nu este o problemă um, extrem de dificilă de imaginat. Da? Deci ar putea să se existe un sistem de genul ăsta. Poți să iei conținutul de, de e-book-uri al unei edituri da? și să scoți clasifica, un clasificator acolo. O problemă destul de mare ar fi um, variabilitatea cărților și dimensi variabilitatea în dimensiune a seturilor de date și să ai seturi de date foarte inegale. Dar cu puțin data science se rezolvă și chestia asta. Adică ar putea să fie, cate categoriile ar putea fi reduse la nivel de capitol, normalizate și s-ar putea realiza ceva de genul acesta. E un proiect foarte interesant, nu știu să-i fi făcut, nu știu care e nevoia pentru așa ceva, dar e realizabil și e realizabil cu tehnologiile de acum. Dacă urmărim o precizie undeva pe la 90%. Dacă acceptăm o rată de eroare de undeva pe la 10% în chestia asta, e perfect realizabil. Dacă vrem 99,99999, e cam greu. Da, dar se poate face așa ceva. Deci orice firmă care face consultanță pe partea asta de NLP ar putea să elaboreze un asemenea proiect. Și există câteva și în România care fac uh, lucruri de genul acesta. Alte întrebări? Ok. Bine, atunci. Mulțumim, Virgil, pentru prezentare. Cu mare plăcere. Și ne vedem peste două săptămâni. Să fiți atenți la paginile noastre de social media ca când anunțăm următorul eveniment.